the Alaskan wilderness. For years, a vast buffer between North America and the Soviet Union is today becoming the focus for defense against a growing Soviet bomber threat and the projection of U.S. air power in the strategically important Arctic and North Pacific. As technology has changed and the Pacific Rim has grown in geopolitical importance, the defenders of Alaska have taken on new roles. The U.S. Air Force, Army and Navy are developing a highly coordinated Arctic warrior operational strategy to blunt Soviet power and deter the USSR's frequent intelligence and strategic bomber exercises in the region. The Arctic warriors face unique challenges. From east to west, Alaska extends as far as all the lower 48 states, with five times as much coastline to defend. The central threat today is the long-range Soviet Tu-95 Bear bomber. The Bear H can carry up to 10 nuclear-armed AS-15 cruise missiles. Launched over southern Alaska or Canada, they could reach the heart of the United States. The Bear G, often equipped for electronic intelligence missions off Alaska, can carry two shorter-range AS-4 cruise missiles. In wartime, these would probably be used against Alaskan and Canadian targets to open the way for the Bear H and its long-range missiles. In 1987 and 1988, the Bears flew scores of strike training missions near the Alaskan coast and the Aleutian Islands. On 8,000-mile round trips from the central USSR, they practiced the procedures that would be used in a nuclear strike mission. So far, however, none of the Soviet bombers has entered U.S. airspace. On the horizon is the supersonic Black Jack bomber and a new generation of faster cruise missiles for it and the Bear G. These developments are redefining the mission of the U.S. Air Force Alaskan Air Command headed by Lieutenant General Thomas G. McInerney. We have seen a growth in long Soviet long-range aviation in the Arctic region. For instance, in the early 80s, we saw less than five long-range aviation flights per year. The mid-80s, we have grown up to 50 flights per year. A slight drop-off last year. We don't know if it's significant. But the significance of these long-range aviation flights by the Bear H has changed our thinking. It's because the Soviets have changed their strategy. They have moved to cruise missiles that the Bears bring into the, as a mothership into the Arctic Basin in North Canada and then launch on the United States. So the cruise missile has changed the Soviet strategy on long-range aviation, the manned bomber force. And that's very important because Alaska is the furthest north location that can reach these airplanes. And for that reason alone, Alaska NORAD region plays a key role in the defense of manned bombers and cruise missiles against the North American continent. If training were to become the real thing, Soviet bombers headed for Alaska would be escorted by new fighters. The Su-27 flanker is expected to be facing Alaska soon. And the MiG-31 Foxhound has already been deployed to Soviet Far Eastern bases. Well, the growing Soviet fighter force in the Far East military district is concerning me. Uh, the Foxhound can reach Anchorage and go back at altitude if he didn't have to spend much time. So we're now seeing for the first time a long-range fighter that could reach here, which means that our fighters could be engaged fighter versus fighter. So that is a concern. But Alaskan Air Command, too, has new capabilities. The 21st Tactical Fighter Wing operates out of Elmendorf Air Force Base near Anchorage. The wing has 34 F-15C and F-15D fighters with improved radar and conformal fuel tanks for greater range. They are divided between the 43rd and the 54th Tactical Fighter Squadrons. The two squadrons maintain F-15s on alert at two forward bases of the Alaskan Air Command. From Galena in west-central Alaska 
and from King Salmon at the northern neck of the Aleutians, they scrambled to intercept and shadow the bears. Improved detection, command and control over Alaska's vast distances are provided by two E-3 AWACS aircraft from the Tactical Air Command's 962nd Airborne Warning and Control Squadron, also at Elmendorf. Training together day in and day out, the fighter and AWACS crews are developing new tactics for a theater where an interception can reach out a thousand miles, and Soviet and American soil are only a few minutes flying time apart. Supporting their mission are KC-135 tankers of the Strategic Air Command's Alaskan Tanker Task Force and the Alaskan Air National Guard, operating from Eielson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, just south of the Arctic Circle. And an improved ground radar network linking stations of the Alaskan Air Command, Tactical Air Command, and the Joint U.S.-Canadian North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. The old dew line is being replaced by an integrated north warning system that will eventually incorporate 52 radars across Alaska and Canada. Two dozen Fairchild A-10 ground attack aircraft of the Alaskan Air Command's 343rd Tactical Fighter Wing, based at Eielson, are available for quick deployment to the Far East or across the pole to Europe, which they can reach more quickly than units from the lower 48. And since World War II, when the Japanese easily seized islands in the Aleutian chain, no planner can ignore the defense of Alaska itself. The A-10s train for that mission with army units in Alaska's superb training ranges. Air power in Alaska is part of three organizations. The Air Force's Alaskan Air Command, the Alaskan region of NORAD, and the newly activated Alaskan Command, a subordinate unified command which stretches the U.S. Pacific Command's responsibilities from Alaska's north slope southward to the Indian Ocean. I think the strategic and tactical importance of Alaska starts with uh, our location. We are the closest between the Soviet Union, the United States and the Soviet Union. The Far East Military District buttresses right up against our borders here. So that strategic location, when one talks about naval forces, ballistic missile submarines, submarines, long-range aviation, Bear H's, Bear G's, the location where we are is a superhighway, if you will, and we're part of that superhighway and control those resources that flow or could flow in wartime back and forth. The cutting edge of the Arctic Warrior concept is the air superiority and air sovereignty mission of the F-15 fighters. <laughs> Colonel Shell Storer commands the 21st Tactical Fighter Wing, whose mission has expanded to strategic deterrence as the Soviets have increased their dependence on air-launched cruise missiles. What our primary goal is to try and intercept the launcher you know, if we wait until they drop their cruise missiles, we've got a big task ahead of us. So our job is to try and get as far out forward as we can to attack those bear H's when they come inbound and take the airplane out before it launches. Alaskan Air Command fighters have two roles. An air sovereignty role against the Soviet bombers and an air superiority role against Soviet fighters that might escort the bombers. All the F-15 pilots uh, in uh, the 21st TAC fighter wing either come from or are likely to go back to an F-15 unit anywhere. Uh, the F-15 role, of course, uh, worldwide is air superiority, so we, one, want to train them to be able to conduct the full range of air superiority missions. In Alaska, uh, we are essentially the, uh, you could call it a tripwire, I suppose, the farthest forward point in relation to the, uh, the lower 48 and the Canadian, the North American landmass 
Uh, so we need to be able to have all the skills available to us to uh, meet whatever type of threat comes in. That situation makes the experience of Alaskan fighter pilots unique. At any moment of any day, they may find themselves a few hundred yards from a Soviet strategic bomber, hundreds of miles from shore over the Arctic Ocean or Bering Sea. Lieutenant Colonel Pete Marty, commander of the 43rd Tactical Fighter Squadron, is aware of the special demands his pilots must meet. A young pilot on his first assignment to Alaska can be put into a really unique, terrifying perhaps experience in that on uh, his first operational uh, tour, he is put out at uh, Galena Air Force Base, short runway, middle of the winter, slick, at night, and launched off on an active uh, air intercept against an unknown, perhaps from a, uh, another country. And uh, he takes off, his lead may abort, so therefore he has to be prepared to go off into the dark night, go against uh, an international type situation, on a very young age, so he really has to know his stuff and uh, be top-notch. Between standing alert for intercepts, F-15 pilots in Alaska have some of the best air superiority training opportunities in the world, thanks to the low population density. They can practice intercepts and dogfighting at all altitudes. The Alaskan Air Command encourages other units to train here, says Colonel Storer. We've got some absolutely fantastic range space here uh, in Alaska. Uh, I've flown in the Pacific, I've flown in Europe, and I've flown in the continental United States, and I have never seen better uh, training airspace than what we have here. Uh, out in the west, in our stony airspace, we have uh, terrain that can simulate Korea, terrain that can simulate uh, European mountains, can simulate the Folded Gap Plains. Uh, truly outstanding airspace. Wherever they come from, the vast Alaskan distances mean that pilots must raise fuel consciousness to a high art, especially when bad weather can force a diversion of hundreds of miles, and when Soviet cruise missile range make it necessary to plan for intercepts increasingly far from base. Major Steve Brown, Director of Operations for the 43rd, finds the newest F-15s a big improvement in that area. The uh, F-15C has been a big boom for, uh, for Alaska here in Alaskan Air Command. The additional fuel capability with the conformal fuel tanks and the additional internal fuel not only gives us a longer range capability to go out and uh, get out to the bombers farther out, 
but it also gives us the capability in carrying that fuel to go farther out, still come back and have plenty of gas to divert with. Distance is a challenge to the A-10s flying out of Eilson as well as to the F-15s. Here one refuels from a tanker task force, KC-135, 18,000 feet above the Yukon River, abeam the Arctic Circle. Lieutenant Colonel Mark Perkins, Assistant Director of Operations for the 18th Tactical Fighter Squadron at Eilson, has become used to conditions at this latitude. The challenge of flying in Alaska, two things come to mind, the cold weather and the darkness, particularly during the wintertime. Uh, we do operate up here uh, probably four months out of the year where it's totally dark. Uh, low sun angles, uh, slick conditions, uh, runway uh, braking conditions are uh, very slick, and we uh, operate up here under ramp conditions that some other units wouldn't even dare to walk out of the building. The darkness itself, we uh, get up in the morning, it's dark. We come to work, it's dark. You go home, it's dark. The sun uh, never comes up more than just above the horizon, so we're constantly operating uh, in the darkness. Uh, we become uh, very proficient at that, and we are the best uh, winter night fighters, uh, I think, in the world during the uh, winter months. And of course, uh, during the uh, summer months, we're the, we're the best day fighters because we do have 24 hours of daylight. Colonel Mike Ferguson, former vice commander of the 343rd Tactical Fighter Wing, also knows what it takes to keep his A-10s flying. We routinely operate in environments around here in the wintertime of 20 to 40 below. And our maintenance people have worked out a lot of procedures that keep us flying at a normal ute rate, utilization rate that is, during uh, during this, the winter months here, just like we do during the summer. But we found out when you go to the extremes of 60 below, it's a little bit different. And we learned a lot of lessons out of that. We learned that, uh, that people slow down a lot, but they, they still continue to function very well. Machinery is very difficult to operate in, in uh, 55 to 60 below temperatures. Fluids stop being fluids. Uh, rubber stops being pliable. And it was very difficult, but we did learn those lessons. We learned that once you get a vehicle started, the best thing to do in those kind of temperatures is to keep it running. And that goes for airplanes, too. Our people are very innovative, you know. They make, they make bubbles out of heaters and plastic, uh, large plastic sacks. Fill it up with hot air and get inside of it, and you can warm up in a hurry. The F-15 ground crews face equal challenges, according to Colonel Doug Ferry, Deputy Commander for Maintenance for the 21st Tactical Fighter Wing. The winter of 1989 was a very difficult winter for us. We had wind chill factors that got as low as minus 80 to 85 degrees with ambient temperatures normally ranging around minus 35 for a two-week period. This was the coldest that it had been here in Elmendorf in approximately 10 years. That winter certainly provided the challenge that we needed in terms of operating in the cold environment and seeing how well our airplanes would perform with this severe weather. The harsh weather goes with the territory, a territory growing in importance as geopolitical balances change. Uh, the importance of having A-10s based in Alaska is our central location to the European theater and also to the Pacific theater. Uh, we are able to deploy from Alaska and uh, go o right over the North Pole itself into the European theater in a minimum amount of time. Uh, going over to uh, Asia or the PACAF theater, uh, the A-10s can deploy from Eilson Air Force Base down through Shimia in the Aleutian Islands and then across to Korea or any place in the Pacific in a minimum amount of time. So we're centrally located even though it seems like we're at the top of the world. It's a great place to train. The weather's great. The terrain mirrors very closely where we'll be required to fight 
if and when we're called upon to fight. And finally, uh, we've got the 6th Infantry Division light right next door, so we're in very close proximity with the people that we're committed to go to war with, and we can practice with them every day. The maneuverable, heavily armed A-10s are also crucial to the defense of Alaska from a potential attacker just across the Bering Strait. I guess the first question would be, uh, do we need to defend Alaska? Uh, sometimes we need to remind people that Alaska is part of the United States and it's sovereign territory and it needs to be defended. We have a lot of high value strategic reconnaissance uh, assets here in the state. So we don't see massive land forces attacking the state, but we do see special forces that will require uh, us to deploy forward to the uh, outer edges of the state and support uh, uh, maritime forces and also land forces in the defense of uh, Alaska. Neither F-15s nor A-10s could do their job without aerial refueling. Keeping the Arctic warriors in the air over Alaska's enormous distances is the responsibility of the Strategic Air Command's Alaskan Tanker Task Force, managed by SAC's 6th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. The 168th Air Refueling Squadron of the Alaskan Air National Guard also plays a vital role. Three or four SAC tankers are always on one-hour alert, and the Air Guard is increasing its alert force as well. The tankers support all elements of the Arctic Warriors operations, F-15s, AWACS. and A-10s. Navy fighters operating from carriers in the North Pacific. And military transport aircraft in transit to and from Asia via the Great Circle Route. Seven to 11 tankers are rotated in from squadrons in the lower 48 for 42-day stints. The assignment is eagerly sought. The crews typically fly twice as much as they would at home and get unique operational experience. Colonel Bob Warner, commander of the 6th Strategic well, Reconnaissance Wing. With, if you compare us to other tanker operations down in the lower 48, they basically are training crews to do a job. Uh, when you come up here to Alaska on, on your TDY duties or the crews, we fly almost totally operational missions. Uh, we are here to service the people who need refuelings. You have to sort of imagine that uh, Alaska is a state that's almost 800 miles uh, across in depth, and that you could cross the whole Great Plains of the United States from uh, say, the bottom of Oklahoma all the way up to North Dakota and looking at the kind of area that we uh, have to cover for refueling. So the vastness of the state and the vastness of the area means that airplanes operating up here need gas to be able to go someplace, do a mission, and return home. And uh, they cannot carry a payload and, uh, and perform the mission if, if with the amount of gas they would need to do it. The Alaskan Air National Guard's responsibilities have grown with mid-air refueling needs in the region. Its tanker force will soon grow to seven aircraft. Lieutenant Colonel Doug Clinton, commander of the 168. Uh, we work rather closely with the, uh, the active duty SAC forces here in Alaska and uh, contribute somewhat to their tanker task force mission. Uh, we do place one of our aircraft currently on alert uh, for one week out of every five. Uh, also, we, uh, we share air refueling training in the theater Covering such a vast territory would be inconceivable without sophisticated radar and command, control, and communications techniques. At the center of the radar system is the NORAD Region Operations Control Center, or ROC. Its Elmendorf headquarters is known as Top ROC for its mission at the top of the world. Here, each Red Star plaque marks a successful intercept mission. Major Jim Johnson is Director of Operations for the 744th Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron. ROC is the Regional Operation Control Center. That's NORAD's command and control unit here in Alaska. We take the uh, 
radar data from the 21 ground-based radars here, and it's displayed on our radar scopes. We use that to detect any uh, unauthorized aircraft in our sovereign airspace. Two independent systems link Top Rock with 21 radars of NORAD, the Alaskan Air Command, and TAC. One is a SATCOM geosynchronous satellite link. The other is a meteor burst system, which bounces signals from ionized dust left in the outer atmosphere by tiny meteors. Of course, we're manned 24 hours a day, and we basically have 30 people on each crew that work eight-hour days. On the rock floor itself, we're basically divided down the middle of the ops room with the surveillance people on the left and the weapons controllers on the right. The surveillance people go through the process of detecting any tracks as they entered our sovereign airspace, our identification area, and then uh, assigning symbology to it. If the track cannot be ID'd through correlation of flight plans or a positive friend or foe uh, beacon squawk, then the senior director coordinates the scramble of the fighters and our weapons controllers vector the fighters out for the intercept. Under peacetime rules, the team at Top Rock exercises extreme restraint. Even should a Soviet aircraft penetrate U.S. airspace, they have instructions to divert it back out or direct it to land at a civilian airport unless it shows obvious hostile intent. U.S. aircraft in the Bering Strait region and the Far Aleutians maintain buffer zones and keep close watch on their navigation systems to avoid crossing into Soviet airspace. Rock operations are coordinated with the Canadian NORAD Control Center in Ontario. When needed, responsibility for intercepts can be passed from one center to the other. A Canadian Brigadier General serves as deputy to Lieutenant General McInerney in his NORAD capacity. Many of Alaska's radar stations can be supplied only by air or by river barge for most of the year. Here at Tatalina in west central Alaska, half a mile of elevation separates the top camp and the main facility. Like the other stations, Tatalina has been upgraded from 1950s technology to a new radar with computerized control and satellite data links. In addition to enhancing their capabilities, these changes have made it possible to cut crew requirements by 90% or more, saving $100 million a year. Tatalina and the other sites are operated by General Electric Government Services under contract to the Air Force. This facility is home to 15 technicians who live and work in two geodesic domes far below the ray dome on the peak. Temperatures can reach 70 degrees below zero and the facility is resupplied by aircraft which must land on a short, narrow runway. The key new element in the Arctic Warrior's radar capability is the Boeing E-3 Airborne Warning and Control System, or AWACS, whose high altitude surveillance can cover two and a half million square miles in a single flight. AWACS makes it possible to spot even low-flying aircraft using terrain features to mask their approach from ground radars. Standard procedures make it possible to divert any AWACS training flight into an intercept mission and AWACS crews here stand alert for rapid takeoffs. The importance of AWACS cannot ever be underestimated because it is a mobile radar and with these vast areas that we must cover the flexibility of AWACS to move out when the Soviets don't know. It's unpredictable when it's going to be there. It gives me as a commander and our team here a great flexibility and it gives us our eyes which is so important in warning and in defense. The AWACS extend not only the eyes of the Alaskan Air Command but also its communications. Lieutenant Colonel Tom Toops, commander of the 962nd Airborne Warning and Control Squadron. In addition to extending the radar coverage of the ground-based radars, the E-3 also has the comm capability to maintain comm with the F-15s assigned here at Elmendorf throughout the intercept. In addition, we can communicate with the ROC, the Regional Operation Control Center back here at Elmendorf throughout the entire intercept by using HF radios or SATCOM communication. Until the AWACS came to Alaska in 1986, fighters had to remain within about 200 miles of ground radar sites. 
the United States could not risk losing radar and communications coverage of its fighters in such a sensitive zone. Now, with the AWACS wide coverage and communications relay capabilities, intercepts 1,000 miles and more at sea are possible. Bogey 240, 245. Because of Alaska's strategic importance, a NORAD representative on each AWACS mission has the authority to direct intercepts from the aircraft if communications with Top Rock are disrupted. On an AWACS flight, it is the mission crew commander who tells the pilots where to fly and determines how the radar surveillance will be conducted. Major Steve Carr, a mission crew commander, describes the organization in flight. The division of labor uh, on board the AWACS uh, during mix mission execution is very specific. Uh, first of all, the surveillance section is uh, the one that's primarily responsible for picking up the track initially and assigning some symbology to that track. Once they have done their job and we have told the uh, track, by that I mean we've passed that information to the ground, we have received the identification on the track, that has an effect on the action we'll take uh, from then on. Assuming that track is a track that we wish to intercept, then the weapons directors who are under the, the direct uh, supervision of the senior director on board the airplane We'll take the fighters, the F-15s in this case, and uh, we'll be responsible for the tactics to intercept and at that point identify that particular track. Supporting the surveillance and fighter controllers are highly trained technicians who manage the aircraft radar, computer and satellite communication systems. AWACS patrols often extend thousands of miles on round trips to the end of the Aleutian chain or to the North Slope. With mid-air refueling, and AWACS can stay aloft for long periods. Here, one is refueled over central Alaska. Alaska is one of the few places in the world where AWACS and fighter crews can work together so closely and frequently, briefing and debriefing together not only for the bomber intercept missions, but also for the fighter versus fighter air superiority role. There are important benefits for both the AWACS and fighter crews. Lieutenant Colonel Toops. In addition to the air sovereignty role here at Elmendorf, we in the 962nd uh, also have an air superiority or dogfight mission that we have to train our controllers for. A good example of how we train them is through daily training missions where we would control F-15s against another aircraft, for example, F-18s, Canadian F-18s, who deploy here from Coal Lake frequently to get that type of training. Because the AWACS aircraft in Alaska perform a NORAD mission, Canadian military personnel routinely fly in most crew positions. The AWACS crews and fighter pilots jointly develop new tactics to counter new Soviet fighters and the Blackjack cruise missile carrier, which fly much faster than the propeller-driven bears. As an example, we've used the uh, B-1 and its capabilities to simulate the capabilities of the Blackjack bomber. We work with the, the wing in their simulator, their flight sim, and we also have developed simulation tapes that enable the F-15 pilots to come on board the E-3 and observe the flight profile or expected flight profile of a blackjack and a better ways to counter that threat. Contact single target, 280 for 28, Angels 24. Single contact, 260 for 14. Lock 260 for 13 miles, Angels 22. Zero one to gauge. Single hit there. Splash trailer. Today, when the threat still takes the form of the bear bombers, the first to meet it are often F-15s based here at Galena Airfield near the Arctic Circle. In fact, the field has a long historical connection with the Soviet Union, according to Lieutenant Colonel Tom Patimerme of the 50-72nd Combat Support Squadron, which manages the facility. Uh, 1941 to 1942, the base was used as a drop-off point in the Lend-Lease program. Uh, as the United States uh, ferried fighters to the Soviet Union in World War II. Uh, one of the unique structures on the base is the Birchwood hangar that was built in 1941-1942, uh, both with U.S. and Soviet money and construction workers to support that effort. 
Flying the F-15 out of Galena is, is definitely a challenge. Uh, one of the key factors is the runway length. Uh, our runway usable length is 6,600 feet, which is the shortest operational F-15 runway the Air Force uses. Uh, the cold weather in the dark at Galena is also a challenge. Uh, we're approximately a little over uh, 200 miles from Fairbanks, which is Isleson Air Force Base, over 300 miles to Elmendorf, which is our primary base. So our divert uh, capability and, and divert options if the weather goes down is a significant challenge. On the banks of the spectacular Yukon River, Galena is only 350 miles from the Soviet mainland. When its pilots pass Little Diomede Island, they are only two miles from Soviet territory on Big Diomede Island. Lieutenant Colonel Pete Marty, commander of the 43rd Tactical Fighter Squadron, knows what that proximity to the Soviet Union means. It's often crossed my mind sitting alert uh, in Alaska at King Salmon or Galena that there are Soviet fighter pilots sitting alert in uh, flagons and uh, foxhounds just on the other side of the border within a very short distance. And that the fact that they must consider that uh, we have a very capable air force on this side of the uh, dateline uh, facing them in case of hostilities. When Soviet aircraft are detected, all the resources of the Air Force in Alaska are coordinated to intercept them. Let's follow an actual bear intercept as F-15s, AWACS, and tankers are directed toward the incoming target. The intercept package is coordinated from Top Rock at Elmendorf, part of a chain of command and control that can extend, if necessary, from an F-15's cockpit all the way to NORAD headquarters in Colorado Springs or to the White House. Two F-15s of the 21st Tactical Fighter Wing are kept ready for takeoff on five minutes' notice, armed and fueled in their alert cells at Galena. While fighter pilots taxi into takeoff position, the controllers at Top Rock balance distance, time, and fuel for an encounter that may be a thousand miles from Anchorage. An AWACS takes off. and a tanker is scrambled from the alert force at Eilson.
Aboard the AWACS, the radar, control and communications teams begin to coordinate the intercept package as all its elements converge on the intruder. Afterburner takeoffs are the rule for the fighters. With two conformal fuel tanks, two wing tanks, four sparrows and four sidewinders, an F-15C weighs 67,500 pounds. The intercept mission can last six or seven hours, making fuel critical. Here, missile-armed F-15s refuel over pack ice in the Arctic Ocean en route to intercept Soviet bears. AWACS personnel supply position data to the fighter pilot and relay communications back to Top Rock. Bogey 270, 10 miles. Good, 10 miles, no good. Both fighters and AWACS use their radio and radar selectively to minimize Soviet opportunities to gather intelligence about their capabilities. Gradually, the distance closes. The AWACS usually remains at least 100 miles from Soviet aircraft, but a tanker may close into 10 miles along with the fighters and remain parallel during the intercept. In the clear air of the Arctic, visual contact is often made at 50 miles or more. The turboprop engines of the Bear may make it seem out of date, but appearances can be deceiving. This is one of the most capable long-range bombers and cruise missile platforms in the air. Major Steve Brown describes what it's like to approach a Soviet Bear. In the uh, final actual intercept portion of, uh, of the uh, Bear intercept or coming up to identify a uh, friendlier foe, uh, the most important thing that we're worried about is, for, of course, the tail guns on the, uh, on the bears. We're making sure in our tactics as we're coming in, there's always a guy in a firing position, such that if we are fired on as we're coming in, again identifying uh, that bear, that we'll have a person who will be in a position that they could fire back if called upon. Our first response, though, if we found the, uh, the guns uncaged and tracking us, would be get out of the gun range. So our first uh, thing we'd do is to break away. Once we have uh, taken uh, stock of the situation, we figure that in fact the bears uh, do not mean us any harm and are flying in the in international airspace. And uh, we're going to go on in, take a look and see, uh, identify the type of bear that it is. And then uh, the next thing now is we want to get some pictures of them. So uh, we'll have one person in identifying, looking for a tail number uh, on the bear, while the other one is in a cover position. If there's two bombers, we still only uh, pay our attention to one uh, initially, making sure that we, uh, we keep ourselves covered, and then we'll clear wingman on up to the, other, uh, to the other bear, with the other fighter staying in a position. Uh, again, not ever letting down our guard. The intercept team may fly in formation with the Soviet bombers for two hours or more, taking turns refueling from the KC-135 as needed. As the Americans take photographs, their counterparts aboard the bear use their own cameras. At times, they wave, but the F-15 pilots rarely reciprocate. This is an enemy bomber approaching U.S. territory. No game, but part of a serious show of strategic readiness by both sides. Lieutenant Colonel Marty recalls his experience. It's a unique experience that in uh, flying uh, jet fighters and when you wear helmets and have your own jet engine and cockpit noise, you very air seldom hear anything outside your aircraft. However, approaching a bear aircraft, uh, it's you can, unique in that you can actually hear the counter-rotating props uh, grinding away as it's uh, moving through the sky. 
And you're impressed by the uh, size of the aircraft and the capability, and of course, the big red star on the tail. Eventually, the intruders turn and head for home, and the U.S. flyers do the same. The tension eases on the long flight back to base. Again, the flyers can enjoy the beauty and emptiness of Alaska. The bear flights have become less frequent lately, and strategic confrontation has given way to U.S.-Soviet civilian exchange programs. But the Arctic warriors ensure that the strategic deterrent is always in place.